It's always a thrill to hear Fred Gray because when you hear Fred speak, you're hearing about uh, someone who was on the front lines of history and really uh, played a significant role in the American Civil Rights Movement. It's just a, it's just a thrill uh, for us to be able to host him today. As many of you know, Fred was the lawyer for Rosa Parks and when she was arrested on that fateful bus. Uh, he was the first civil rights lawyer for Martin Luther King Jr. He represented the victims uh, from the uh, Tuskegee a syphilis study, and uh, which uh, ended up with a uh, many years later, 65 years after the study uh, started, with a formal apology for President Clinton in 1997. Fred, the cases that he—I've got a list of important cases here, and, and this would take up the whole time just to read through the cases. Uh, Fred started out as a preacher. Uh, at the age of 12, he went off to boarding school in Nashville to study at the Nashville Christian Institute, a, a Church of Christ uh, a preaching school of sorts. And uh, he studied with uh, Marshall Keeble, who in Church of Christ circles is a renowned uh, preacher, and uh, spent five years at boarding school learning how to be a preacher. And then he went back home to school at Alabama State, and Fred decided, uh, based upon some experiences he had, which perhaps uh, we'll hear about today, uh, that uh, he would not spend his, his life as a paid preacher, although he's really preached all his life, but that he would, uh, he would become a lawyer, and he would end segregation everywhere he found it. He had to leave the state to go to law school. Uh, he went to law school at Case Western Reserve in Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, I found this out this week. I couldn't believe this. For you students who are thinking about taking the bar and are whining and complaining about what faces you this summer, Fred Gray took not one bar examinations the summer after he graduated from law school, but two. <laughs> he took the Ohio bar in June and then the Alabama bar in July and passed them both <laughs> and uh, proceeded to uh, make good on his word and uh, played a significant role. It's hard to hard to understate his role. A significant role in working to desegre to, to uh, end desegre to end segregation in the South. I have this great picture that's in the Pepperdine Bible lecture. I know you can't see it. Here's a picture of Fred Gray at 15 with Marshall Keeble and some other of the uh, young uh, preachers in training at that Nashville Christian Institute. Uh, it's to our good fortune. Uh, Fred's been a, a church leader for all of his adult life, but it's our good fortune that he made that choice so many years ago to be a lawyer. Uh, some of you know that Professor Caldwell and I are, have, are working, it's a lifetime project, we're working on a book about hero lawyers uh, and telling the story, arguing that that's not an oxymoron. In fact, uh, there are hero lawyers out there and trying to tell the stories of, of folks who've, who have made a difference because of their courage as lawyers. And the first chapter we wrote was on Fred Gray uh, because he is truly a hero uh, and someone who makes the profession proud. So, Fred Gray. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim. That's the third time this week he has done that. <laughs> so, uh, we want to thank him very much, and I uh, appreciate it so very much. And I'm also appreciative to Bob for uh, talking to Jerry and convincing Jerry that I should come over here and share uh, this occasion with you during your lunch hour. And uh, next I want to say to you students, you are more courageous than I am. I would not have, in the middle of my final examinations, <laughs> stopped to have lunch with a, a civil rights lawyer. But... You know, there are some people who can do that, and there are other people who needed to stay away so that they would be sure that they'll be able to take care of the exams. Uh, I remember when I was in law school, uh, they had down in the basement, I didn't go down there often, but there was a group of guys down there who spent a lot of time playing cards. <laughs> but you know those same guys could come up there and write the best paper you want to see. But I knew I couldn't do that. So I just stuck to my little schedule and worked it out and managed to, to get by. So I'm appreciative to these students who've taken time, as well as the faculty who are here and other staff members. Uh, I also want to acknowledge my, my wife, Carol, who travels around the country with me. <clears throat> I was married to another young lady for 40, my, 40 years <laughs> and lost her unexpectedly. And uh, Carol had been married to another gentleman for some 33 years, and he died unexpectedly. And we met at a church functions by some mutual church friends some years ago. 
and I have been married for the last eight years. So those of you who are afraid to get married, <laughs> uh, some people uh, uh, can't have one good marriage. I've had two good ones, and uh, I do recommend it, but you have to take certain precautionary steps before you take that one in order to be sure, or you think you'll be sure that it works out. So we're glad that uh, Carol could join me here today. Let me do another couple of housekeeping chores. If you really want to know all about the civil rights movement and, and know about the behind the scene activities, and usually people want to know how I happen to represent Rosa Parks and how I happen to represent Dr. Martin Luther King and what kind of persons they are. Uh, I wrote a book a long time ago on the bus ride to justice. Uh, some we had ordered, but they've all been sold. But if you're interested, uh, I do have some order blanks, and we'll be happy to do that for you. The other commercial, and then I'll get to what you wanted me to talk about, is uh, some years ago we recognized that there was a lot of history being made in uh, middle Alabama that was not being preserved and we also recognize that uh, all the ethnic groups who had occupied that land uh, have made contributions. And basically, there are three of those groups, Native Americans, and that's true all over this country for that matter. It, uh, they owned it. Then Europeans came in and took over their lands and brought with them slaves. And then we went through the whole reconstruction and desegregation area. So we have at least three ethnic groups, Native Americans, Americans of European descent, and Americans of African descent, who have played major roles in building this country into what it is today. And we thought it would be good if we had a museum that didn't just talk about African Americans or just about Native Americans or just about European Americans or just about Confederate Americans but to show the contributions made by all under one roof. And then if you see that, you'd recognize the fact that each one of us, each ethnic group, has made substantial contributions and built upon others. And then we can get together, hopefully, and solve whatever problems are, is left. So that's one thing. The second thing, and in the center of the brochure, and I hope all of you have a copy, you'll see a picture of our museum, the, a part of the museum. And I represented the men in the infamous Tuskegee syphilis study. I had been filing lawsuits against cities and counties in the state of Alabama. And the Justice Department, early on in those cases, we were able to get Judge Johnson to uh, designate the government as a party. Uh, so we were able not only to have the plaintiffs and whatever strength we had, but we had the full force of the United States government working with us. Then on the 27th of July in 1972, I found out that the federal government was conducting and had been conducting since 1932 an experiment with African-American men, 623, about half who had syphilis, half who did not have syphilis, and untreated, uh, they call it a, 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 untreated, a study of untreated syphilis in the Negro male. And even when syphilis became, uh, when penicillin became available, they still did not render or give those persons penicillin, and many of them died. I represented those people, was able to get a, a settlement for them, and finally was able to get uh, the President Clinton to make an apology. He invited those who were living in their relatives to the White House on the 15th of May. Matter of fact, it'll be 12th anniversary just this coming week, 1957, I believe it was. And uh, he apologized to them. And what those men told me, and all of them are dead now, but before they died, they said, lawyer, if you just do one more thing for us, we would like a permanent memorial in Tuskegee 
so that, and, and, and even Mr. Shaw, and one of his grandchildren, I believe, works here on campus, was at my session on yesterday. He was the great grand, yes. He was the, the spokesman for the group who introduced the president at the White House in the East Wing. And he announced then the formation of the Tuskegee Human and Civil Rights Multicultural Center. Because he says when you go down the highway and see a sign talking about some historic event, he says, we want a permanent memorial. We started out with just that idea, no money, no nothing. And what we, we came back and uh, a local bank was able to uh, give us a bank. And uh, then we had to try to raise some money for it. We found there was some T21 money, that 80% 20 matching. But our people can't look at plans and give. So what I've been doing for the last eight to 10 years is going all over the country. I'll go back to Alabama tomorrow, and then I'll get on another plane, go up to Seattle for next Friday for the purpose of raising funds so that this will have the matching money that we need in order to do it. So if you're ever in Tuskegee, uh, in that area, uh, if you know of some nice corporation or persons, or even you, you can feel free to do whatever you can. And I have found that a lot of people will help you, and you, you just have to let them know. Now, that's the commercial. Now, let's talk a little bit about, and it's interesting, what I was supposed to talk about is what? how the Civil Rights Movement led to the election of a president. In order to understand that, you have to understand the Civil Rights Movement. And let me just say this uh, to you students. Don't underestimate what one individual can be responsible for doing. And if you have a real idea, try to do it. When I was a junior at Alabama State College and saw the conditions that existed in Montgomery, I decided that in addition to being a preacher, that everything was completely segregated, the buses, we were having all kinds of problems with them. And I made up my mind that I was going to finish Alabama State go to somebody's law school, not even apply to the University of Alabama because I knew they wouldn't admit me. And I made a secret commitment that I was going to become a lawyer, come back to Alabama, and destroy everything segregated I could find. Now, for an African-American from the ghettos of Montgomery, Alabama, the cradle of the Confederacy, to even think about that was unheard of. I finished Alabama State in uh, May of 51, enrolled in Reston Reserve University in September of 51, finished Reserve in May and June of 54, took the Alabama, the, the Ohio Bar in June, the Alabama Bar in July, passed both of them, and on the 8th of September of 1954, I was licensed to practice in Alabama. And I'm now ready to begin to do what I had in mind of destroying everything segregated I could find. My first case was not Rosa Parks' case. It was not Dr. King's case. It was not John Lewis' case and the people who were beaten back on Bloody Sunday in 65, even though I did represent them. But it was a 15-year-old African-American girl who was arrested under similar circumstances to Mrs. Parks but nine months before. Now, I had had lunch with Ms. Parks almost every day, at least five days a week since I had been practicing, and we had lunch that day. She was the secretary for the Montgomery branch of the NACP. She was also the youth director. She had had the advantage of going to some of these national programs that kind of instructed people how to act and what to do as you proceed to try to do away with segregation. So she knew what to do if anything happened to her. But Claudette Carvin used the public transportation systems in Montgomery to go to and from school every day. She was only 15, 
Coming back home on May on, on March the second, nineteen fifty-five. She sat in a seat that she had sat in before and nothing had happened. But this particular day there were more white people on that bus than usual. They asked Claudette to get up and give them a seat to a white man, and she refused. She said she had paid her money. She was sitting where she had sat before. And she wasn't interested and wasn't doing anything to test anything. She just felt that it was wrong for her to get up, and she didn't get up. She was arrested. Her parents later got in contact with this young lawyer, Fred Gray, who just out of school by about nine months. And I represented her before Judge Hill, who was the juvenile court judge in, in Montgomery. And the same people who later came to Rosa Parks' rescue, Joanne Robinson, who was a teacher at Alabama State, uh, who is just the historical black school in Montgomery, where I attended college, had had an experience on a bus in 1948, almost an empty bus, but a mean bus driver, and all of them were then white. And he wanted her to sit further in the back of the bus. And she became very disgusted and just got off the bus. But she later became uh, the chairman uh, of, of the Women Political Council, black group of African-American women who taught at Alabama State. And they began to keep records of all the bus incidences. So when the right time came, we were able to prove what we needed to do. But Joanne Robinson and E.D. Nixon, who was Mr. Civil Rights then, and Fred Gray came to her rescue. We threatened to have a bus boycott. They assured us that things were going to get better. Instead, they got worse. We later found out that uh, in October, Mary Louise Smith, another young lady who was about 17, was arrested under similar circumstances. So when Mrs. Parks was arrested, uh, we already had the courage of Claudette Carmen, a 15-year-old girl. And if Claudette Carmen had not done what she did, it may not have given Mrs. Parks the courage to do what she did. And if Mrs. Parks had not done what she did, the Montgomery bus boycott would not have started on December the 5th, 1955, and Dr. King would not have been introduced to the nation at that time. And we don't know what would have happened. But the Lord was able to take a series of events from my being admitted to the bar in 54 to Martin Luther King being installed as a minister at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in October of 54. Claudette Carvin's arrest in March of 55. Mary Louise Smith's arrest in October of 55. George Frank M. Johnson being appointed to the United States District Judgeship the, for the Middle District of Alabama by President Eisenhower and he was installed in October of 55, six weeks before Rosa Parks was arrested in December the 1st. We had the beginning of the boycott in, in uh, December 5th. And then you had the whole 369 days of staying off of the bus and Browder versus Gale that integrated them. So you had then the beginning of what is considered the Civil Rights Movement. That was in 55. I mentioned earlier, and I want you to understand, young people played a major role in the Civil Rights Movement. I've told you about Claudette Carvin. Because Mary Louise Smith, who was also a plaintiff in Brower versus Gale, which is a suit that integrated the buses, she was only 18. Martin Luther King, at the time, was 20, what, about 27. I was 24. Abernathy was about 28. Mrs. Parks was about 36. Then you had the, the student demonstrations that started at A&T in 1960, the lunch counter demonstrations, which caught fire and spread it across the nation, and it resulted in the passage of the Public Accommodation Act. And then after the Montgomery bus boycott in, in 55, we had the first Civil Rights Act in 1957 that gave 
the, the federal government, the Justice Department, the authority to bring lawsuits to end, uh, uh, desegre uh, to end discrimination in voting rights cases. Then you had any number of proclamations by various presidents ending segregation. Then you had uh, uh, these women. I told you Mary Louise uh, uh, Joanne Robinson has written a book, and, and she is one of the real architects of the whole civil rights movement. The title of her book is uh, The Montgomery Bus Boycott and the Women Who Started It. You take the young people, SNCC and CORE, they are the ones who really went over to Selma and worked with the local people over there and started the Selma to Montgomery March. And when they were beaten back on what is now Bloody Sunday, I went across the bridge after that had happened that night and they called me and I talked to the individuals and we filed a lawsuit that next day. And before the close of day on Monday, we had filed uh, Williams versus George Wallace, which made the state integrate the buses, uh, made the state protect the marchers as they marched from Selma to Montgomery. That resulted in the passage of the Voting Rights Act. As a result of the passage of the Voting Rights Act, you had thousands of African Americans and other minorities across this nation who became eligible to vote. They elected many minorities, and even more importantly, their vote helped to elect a lot of the majorities. And so you have, with all of these laws and all of these passages, you then have the election of last year. Nobody last year at the beginning or uh, two years ago would have given Senator Obama a chance of becoming president of the United States. But the Lord has a way of doing things and permitting things to happen. And individuals have a way of doing things that cause things to happen. And when you put them all together, I think, and it's my opinion, that when you really look back and see what we did in the civil rights movement, it all contributed toward the election of the 44th president of the United States. And that opinion of mine was sealed, and I'm gonna ask you a question. If you was in my class the other day, don't, don't answer. <laughs> Who know what was the first unit in the inaugural parade? Anybody know who wasn't in my class yesterday? <laughs> Anybody want to take a guess at it? <coughs> yes. How about the Tuskegee Airmen? Tuskegee Airmen? They were there, but that's not it. The first unit was the Rosa Parks bus. If you go back and look at that parade, before all those motorcycles came, the very first unit, then we went back and reset. When I saw it, I sat in my uh, hotel room, and when I saw it, I immediately called home and had them to do some research. And they, it was indicated that that was going to be, they didn't end up saying it was going to be the first unit, but it was going to be there because it symbolically, demonstrated that one reason, one of the contributing factors for the current president being the president was what happened in Montgomery. I don't, and I know a lot of us are worried about the president. I don't know him personally. He didn't grow up through the movement, so I don't know him like I know some of the other persons. And I had some apprehensions too initially, like a lot of folks. But anyone who is able to become president of these United States, once they take office, then it's all of our responsibilities to get behind that person and make him have a successful administration because his success will mean the success of this nation. But when I saw the Rosa Parks bus, I don't have to worry about him getting up every time he make a speech and talk about the race issue. I think it says more than anything else. And as president of these United States, he can 
by assigning his name to the appropriate documents, can do more toward doing away with the vestiges of discrimination than all the speeches that any of us or that he could make. Some things you don't talk about, you just do them. There are many people who say, and I'm concluding, that uh, now that we have an African American in the White House, that is a complete fulfillment of Dr. King's dream, and that all of the minorities now have all of the rights that they are entitled to under the Constitution. I don't think there's anything that could be further away from the truth. All the problems that we had racially before, they're still there. If you look carefully, we still have some serious race problems in this country. I just finished reading, and I recommend that you get a copy of the Urban National Urban League's uh, report on the status of African American in this country. They take five areas. They analyze those five areas, and every one of those, from economics to education to incarceration, you will find that African Americans, when compared to whites, are adversely affected. And you now have more African American males who are in prisons than in institutions of higher learning. And it costs a lot more to keep these people incarcerated than it does to educate them. So what I say to you is that notwithstanding the progress we've made, the struggle for equal justice continues. And the question arises is, what does all of this mean to those of us at Pepperdine University on this nice, pleasant day looking at the Pacific Ocean? It should mean that the struggle for equal justice continues. I want to leave you with a challenge. If what I have said to you means anything, it means, unfortunately, that racism is still alive in this country. If the life and work of Dr. King means anything, it means that the struggle continues for equal justice under the law, particularly for women and minorities. It means that there is a real challenge as to whether the gains we have obtained will continue or whether we will lose them. If we lose, it means that Dr. King and others who have given their lives for the protection of human and civil rights will have died in vain. But if we lose, the nation loses. The struggle has not ended. The racial discrimination in this country has not ended. We do not have a level playing field. There is no such thing as a race-neutral society in America. The consequences of over 350 years of slavery, segregation, and discrimination has not disappeared in the last 50 years after the enactment of civil rights legislation in Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech and even the election of President Obama. Unfortunately, discrimination against African Americans and other minorities in this country is still alive. The question then is, what do we do about it? Number one, I think we have to recognize that we still have a race problem in this country. Number two, it's not going to go away by itself. It has not gone away in 300 and something years, and it won't go away by itself. Third, you're going to have to come up with a plan to eradicate it. And fourth, each one of us as individuals is going to have to be a part of solving these problems. The race question in this country is so ingrained it's going to take the federal government, it's going to take the state government, it's going to take all branches of it, it's going to take the homes, it's going to take the church, and I think the church, and certainly our church, has not lived up to its commitment. So what I say to you as I look back today, you can help make a difference. Don't let anybody tell you that one person can't. But you have to do your best, do what you can, and be willing to take that first step. 
And if you take the first step, somebody else out there will help you. I know when I started out, I recognized that I would have all the forces of the state of Alabama against me. And when they selected me to do the legal work, you know the first thing I did? I called Thurgood Marshall office in New York. Told him who I was, and he didn't know me from nobody. <laughs> but I told him about what had happened in Montgomery, and he had read about the bus boycott. I said, Mr. Marshall, let me come to, come to New York and talk with you and your assistant, because I need all the help I can get. He asked me to come up. I went up, met he and Robert Carter and establish a relationship with the NAACP and later the Legal Defense Fund that has existed throughout the years. They agreed when I took my little complaint that I later filed a draft uh, in uh, Browder versus Gale, but they ag agreed to assist me in providing whatever legal assistance I needed, and it helped. So I say to you students, Whatever your dreams are, whatever your aspirations are, you, you have a right to those dreams. You have a right to those aspirations. But what you have to do, and the only thing about a dream, the first step toward a dream coming true is you must wake up. Thank you very much. <laughs>
controls things and hopefully something will happen to change his position. I don't know whether I answered your question or not. Well, I'm just curious as to what you, how you respond to his, his comments that, uh, you know, the, the, stere the stereotyping, the affirmative action perpetuates, act and resentment it breeds actually ends up being more harmful. Well, you see, if, and, and I don't get hung up on these terms. I don't care whether you call it affirmative action or whatever you call it. If you have somebody who has been enslaved for 350 years and all of a sudden you release them and say, now you're free to do whatever you want to do, you're almost sentencing those persons to failure. On the other hand, if you give them some assistance and some help so that they will be able later to help themselves, and that's all, the only thing affirmative action really does is it permits individuals who, because of the effect of past discrimination, need some assistance. And I think whatever term you want to use, but we need to do what we can to help people who need some help. For example, let me give you another one. The average, well, you take many African Americans who are at the top of the class, who are brilliant, they're going to make it. I don't care whether they're at Pepperdine or wherever they are, they're going to make it. But do you know what? There are a lot of average students, minorities as well as majorities, who if they had a little help, a little assistance, a little more encouragement, a little greater push, that person could develop into an outstanding individual and make substantial contributions. And I think those who are most brilliant and that the institution owes something to these persons to try to help them, I don't care how you, how, how, what you call it or how you develop it, but to help them to develop so that they will have an opportunity to grow and develop. Yes. But what is that second step besides affirmative action? Okay. That's a good question, and I'm not going to answer it. <laughs> but let me tell you this, and I'll tell you why. When I made up my mind that I was going to go and destroy everything segregated I could find, and I was less than under 20, nobody told Fred Gray what to do. Nobody told me to be a lawyer. Nobody told me to do any of those things that I found some way of doing. What I tell people now, and when you get seven to eight, you don't end up being able to give many solutions. You can point up a lot of problems. <laughs> as, a, as a senior spokesman and a senior lawyer, what I say to young lawyers and to these law professors, and this is a good place to say it, is that if we could take what we had with all of the laws of the state of Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas, and all these southern states saying it's unconstitutional to do this and do that, if we were able to take what we had and get that changed so that that whole landscape is over, you with your computers and all the electronics and all of your knowledge, if you put your brains to work and, and, and don't rely on somebody else to solve the problem, collectively, you'll be able to come up with some ways and means to help solve these problems. So I can't give you the answers to how to solve them, but I can tell you those answers are out there. And what I say to you as students and as law professors, when you end up with African Americans are six times the likelihood of being incarcerated than whites. And when we get to a, a point now where the, the income differential, and, and all of these facts are set out in the Urban League's report, 
there ought to be some legal theories somewhere that you can come up with. Whether the administration does it, whether Congress does it, or whatever it is, we ought to be able to find a way to do it. The big thing is, and you know, this, this country has tremendous capacity. We can almost do anything we want to do. And when we do it, we can make it almost appear to be right, whether it's right or not. I think if you make up your mind and make up a sacrifice, and then go out and get somebody else, you don't have to do it all yourself. I tell people every time when you read my book, every lawyer on every side of every one of these cases, I mention them. Because I consider them doing what they had to do and I did what I have to do. I tell you, it's not easy. There's a way. If you can go over and help people in Africa to solve their problems, and if our country can go to uh, all these other countries and change their form of government to a form of government that we think they ought to have. If we ever decide that we want to solve the race problem, you know what we can do? We can solve it. Mm -hmm. This country has not really decided yet that it's still a problem. You're listening to me now, and some of you are right now saying, I hear what he's saying, but race really is not the problem. I'm not telling you that race is all of it. But I'm saying it's a great part of it. Any other questions? Well, well thanks so much, Fred. Thank you. It was a, a wonderful, inspiring talk for all of us. And y'all can visit a little longer, visit as, 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 as long as you'd, uh, you'd like. And again, I want to thank these students for taking time away from your exams to come and listen to a country lawyer, civil rights from Alabama. <laughs>